Lori Bell is literally one of the best flautists uh, in, that I've ever heard. She's been my go-to person. And uh, I just think she's great, you know, great player. And, she, and everyone that's uh, taken lessons with her here has just loved her. I was just watching uh, a video of her playing up at Steamers, uh, which was just mind-blowing. She's, uh, you know, got classical chops, but incredible jazz improviser and puts together these great bands and performs in New York City. So she's another real gem in San Diego. Can you tell me your first memories of music in your life? How was it introduced to you? Look at that. <laughs> I know. No, um, well, you know, my dad was a professional musician, um, so I grew up hearing music in the house constantly. Um, and my mom was a really great accordionist. Um, I'm an only kid, so I had a lot of attention from my dad, and I hung out a lot. Um, my first uh, instrument really was four string guitar uh, at age four. My dad taught me. Uh, <clears throat> how to play that. A uh, Girl from Ipanema was my first song on the four string. Uh, Corcovado followed that and uh, that led to a six string guitar a little bit later. I was a really serious string player before I picked up flute uh, at a later age, uh, around 16. And then the bell started flashing with the flute. That was it, kind of it for me once I got the flute in my hands. But I really was a serious guitarist for a long time. About 12 years, yeah. What was your father's full, full name? Norman. Norman Bell. Bell, yeah. Norman Bell. And, yeah. So that was my first, you know, just hearing my, hearing the records in the house, really growing up, you know, with all the music constantly, constantly. Uh, my mother was a big lover of all the great jazz singers um, and classical and opera and a lot of the great violinists. I grew up hearing a lot of Yasha Heifetz and Yehudi Menuhin and um, yeah, a lot of Jewish music in the house. I grew up in Brooklyn and you know, I'm Jewish on my mom's side. Um, so it was just music, music, music constantly. Yeah, then a lot of jazz albums, you know, going on, uh, you know, between classical and jazz, it was con pretty much constant. What's an example of something that your dad would bring home that you would listen to together? Well, I mean, I was so young, you know, uh, I mean, I, you know, clearly remember my dad coming home with records all the time, uh, you know, a lot of West Montgomery, a lot of Miles, Coltrane, uh, because my dad was seeing all these musicians on 52nd Street, night after night, um, after gigs, that's where they were hanging out, and so my dad got to hear everybody. That was really the time for jazz in New York, 40s and 50s, you know, yeah. Uh, what Which big, big band did he play in? He played in several, but the ones that I remember, um, and Herman, my husband, was able to find a recording um, of uh, Al Donahue's big band, which was kind of a well-known band in New York at the time, um, and Tommy Ryan. I think we've got some photos of my dad over there playing in those bands. And then he freelanced in a lot of other big bands and some quartet gigs and, you know, he was just, he was working full on. Uh, looking back, how does that work ethic, how do you translate that now that, you know, you're an adult and you're a working musician? What did you, what did you really learn from your dad? <laughs> um, Well, a lot, you know, um, the joy of music. My dad really loved what he did. Um, he was a really happy, happy person, really upbeat fellow, you know. Um, I'm a lot more intense and serious about music and stuff. My dad was a lot more joyful, but I do have a lot of, I think, my dad in me. Um, and he took his craft really seriously. He was a monster, you know, he was really accomplished. At 17, he left home to move to New York and started gigging. His sister told me uh, he was really real virtuoso when he left home. He was already like seriously accomplished, but he never took himself really seriously. Never took the music business seriously. He just was sort of happy-go-lucky and really was in New York at a really great time, you know, where like, um, he used to tell me stories about the union and, and how he used to get gigs and it was once a month everybody would meet at the union and uh, 
you know, hey Norm, can you play this day? And he'd write, uh, and he would literally every month just get his calendar completely filled up by everybody gathering it. I know, those are like the good old days. I know, I know. And there was so much work. Now my dad was gigging, you know, night after night. After, of course, long before I came into the picture, you know. My dad was relatively older when I was born. He was like 40 when I, when I came along. Um, but yeah, some great stories, you know. Did your father have any other interests growing up? Like, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just like, curious, like, yeah. if, if that, like, that quality like, transcended through, like, through him, right. through to you. Um, oh my, well, my dad was an avid golfer. Like, so when, <laughs> the way that we found, he found California was he was on tour with the bands, okay? Uh, right, LA, playing one of the big ballrooms uh, back, back in the day, and, uh, so him and the guys took a drive into San Diego one day when they were on tour and my dad just completely flipped. I mean, he saw, like, cause it was in, he told me it was like either November or December. So in, in New York, it was a brutal year that year for, it was like 26 inches of snow back home. And he's out here and it's like Santa Ana, right? You know, you know how it is that time of year. It's blue skies, palm trees. I mean, he just, he wigged. He wigged, he filed it, he never forgot San Diego. And, uh, you know, because he really loved to play golf, and he, you know, just one day, I, you know, up, up and said to my mom, that's it, we're, we're moving to California, we're moving to San Diego. My mother, who was born and bred, old school New Yorker, okay, um, was like, what San Diego? Not, not where, what is it? Like, what is San Diego? Yeah, oh no, it was a scene. It was a scene, because, you know, she didn't want to leave New York. Anyway, we left New York, and we came out here. So my dad was an avid golfer, uh, really a scratch golfer. He was a really great player. Um, her mom remembers. He, he got to know my dad for the last year and a half of his life. Um, my dad's been gone a long time now. Um, Herman and I have been together 26 years already, married. We've known each other 27, so yeah, that's so my dad's been gone, you know, like 25 years or whatever, yeah. But uh, he remembers playing with him. He could not believe, you know, how great my dad played, you know. So, okay, so in college, dance was my minor. Mm. Um, but then I had a dance injury, um, which messed up my back, which kind of led me on sort of an interesting path uh, my whole life. <laughs> yeah, so um, screwed up my back. Um, so that would have been my second uh, real love, because uh, I was actually great in college when I was um, dancing. Um, well, I don't want to say it was great, but I, let's just say I had a lot of potential, you know, to to be probably an excellent, maybe modern jazz dancer. Not, I didn't have the ballet chops. You have to start that when you're really young, I think. You know, you really do. You, you got to start ballet at 10 or something to be really great. Four, there you go. <laughs> Lauren says four, I get it. No, really, it's true. So, but you know, it was a natural at it and didn't even really know that I had that ability until um, much later, so. But yeah, so then that got sort of cut off. But that, that was definitely a passion. Yoga was a passion. But you know, when you have an injury and it kind of messes you up, it, it changes your life, you know? So you can't really do those things. Uh, fortunately, I have music and piano and flute and you know, writing and classical and jazz. I'm pretty busy doing what I do and I really don't think about much else. There's so much to, I mean, you know, really. And there's so many other people I want to study and study with, maybe. You know, I still like to go back to New York and have lessons with my uh, guru, my hero, classical flutist. And, you know, I'm still studying the craft like all the time. Hmm. Yeah, so there's really no end to it. Who, the, who, who do you study with back there? Uh, Judith Mendenhall. Yeah, she's the uh, principal in the American Ballet Theater, uh, among other things. Um, but uh, she's totally incredible. Yeah. Who are your biggest influences? Was it Coltrane? Was it your father? Who, oh, who are you biggest? Well, big, when you Dorothy. Were oh, oh, you mean um, with the flute? I, I think like growing up, who did you just repeat on the on the record? Just, you oh know, yeah, you, you heard that track and you have to repeat. Well, once it. when I started playing flute, it was Hubert Laws. When I first heard Laws, uh, I would say maybe a year after I started playing, um, that was it for me. I was like, that's exactly how I want to play. I mean, I was. Yeah, so I was, you know, listening constantly to Hubert Laws. 
Um, and then a few years later, I got turned on Eric Dolphy and you know major hero of mine i think it was like the greatest doubler i think he did some of the most innovative stuff on flute um you know yeah excellent uh his solo on uh you don't know what love is from the last date album is off the charts i mean with what he was doing uh as a doubler i mean come on it's incredible uh, some of his flute solos but really his uh, bass clarinet like his solo um on magic on bass clarinet is like in my top five or ten favorite solos like of all time. So I'm, I'm just a huge Eric Dolphy fan. You know, I got a call to do a really great gig um, in 2018 with David Binney. Do you know who that is? I do, yeah. He's like an insane alto saxophone player. Um, and we did a big, huge Eric Dolphy tribute. I'm gonna bring in the flyer real quick. I want Please. you guys to see this, this is so cool. No Great pressure. honors of, of my life. Oh, that is so cool. So I got to, so Resonance Records, so you guys know that I was signed with Resonance for yes. a, a short mm -hmm. while, did a Javon album, music of Javon, but Resonance Records is famous for um, collecting um, unheard material, mm. uh, historical things. Um, so that's been the focus of Resonance Records for a while now. So they have unheard, you know, Bill Evans records that had never been released and Wes Montgomery and Sonny Rollins, Gene Harris, on and on and on. And they found through James Newton, who's a great flautist, you guys probably know the name. Um, and James had these tapes that were laid on him by friends or I think maybe even family of Dolphy. And so Resonance Records put it out and I got the call, hello, to play in Los Angeles at Music Head Gallery. I don't know if you guys know that place on Sunset Boulevard. It's a really cool mm -hmm. spot. Oh my God, I, I was just like so blown away that I got the call for the gig. I was just like, hello. Yeah, well, part of Resonance, you know, it kind of made sense, you know, but I was like, why isn't James Newton doing this? But he actually quit playing. He actually had to give up flute for health. He had some health issues and so he's just composing now. But he's doing like these off the charts. Uh, I think he composed something for the Pope. And mm. I mean, he's like doing like some really wild stuff. I picked up a steady gig a year and a half after I started playing flute at an incredible venue called The Prophet. And it was an international vegetarian cuisine where like famous people were coming in from LA a lot of uh, famous uh, Sun Ra showed up one uh, a lot of actors and actresses would come to this place it was off the chart it was like this huge venue three times the size of my house easily uh, the size of my house the waiting room alone where I had a stage piano um, here I'm 17 and a half. This is where I learned how to play standards. I mean, this is where I, you know, I had I had that gig two nights a week for nine years. I also had lots of other gigs. I had, was working at Lario's sometimes five nights a week for a month at a time. These are the good old days where there were like maybe 25 venues in San Diego where jazz was happening all the time. Not one or two now. Yeah. What do you think has contributed to that change in San Diego? Um, well, it's just a completely different landscape now than it was. I mean, I, I don't know how younger folks survive or get it together. I know that you do and you can. Where there's a will, there's a way. You always have to create your own scene. We were saying you have to, in San Diego, create your own scene 25 years ago, you know, we, we were saying that a long time ago, like to survive, and there were plenty, on top of it, there were casuals for days, okay? Now, not only were there loads of venues where you could get gigs, like I say, for five nights a week, a month at a time, like at the old Ilarios, the Summer House Inn in La Jolla, that was the main, like, national room, but locals were also performing there all the time. It was really, great scene but there were also private gigs lots of casuals i i can't even remember a time when i was uh 20s and 30s and and 40s for that matter where i wasn't working minimum five nights a week constantly all my life plus touring plus playing in los angeles you know uh you know i was in china a couple of times uh hong kong play you know touring around i was really busy when mm. i was young 
Um, now it's very different. I, I don't know why, uh, but yeah. this venue's closing, maybe a lack of interest in jazz. It's not, this is not a jazz mecca, you know, San Diego. Uh, even so LA is groove, bad. You know, uh, one, and two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven. It's really hard. One, two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven. Just your educational pathway, just one time, like I went to this elementary oh. school, I went to this middle school, this high school. Oh, um, I, uh, well, when we moved from uh, <laughs> Brooklyn, uh, we lived right at the foot of the boardwalk in Brighton mm -hmm. Beach, um, and so my mom just wanted to be, she didn't want to leave New York, let's just put it that way. So if we were going, she had to be by the beach. So now we're driving down the, down the road, and now we're in San Diego, my dad's in heaven. My mom's like, whatever you do, just get me to the beach. So we see a sign, you know, we don't know from North County. We don't know anything. We don't know PB, Loya, Delma. Oh, we see a sign, Ocean Beach. That's where we went. And that's where we stayed. Literally, that's, that's where I grew up. I grew up in Ocean Beach. Um, I went to OB Elementary. I went to Collier Junior High in Point Loma. I went for a minute to Point Loma High. I was a year younger um, because I had skipped a grade in New York. So I was always a year younger than everybody. So uh, Point Loma High was a drag for me. I wanted to take a year off and play guitar, study with um, a really great guitarist, classical. Um, and uh, so my dad said, that's fine. You're a year young, great, you know. And then I wound up finishing high school at um, a continuation school. I did not want to go back to my, I finished up at uh, Midway Continuation High School. Yep, that's my, that's my upbringing. Uh, and I went to Mesa College for two years, got an associate's degree, and um, that's all the education I've had. Nice. I've always just uh, learned and studied really basically on my own yeah. or with other, you know, just really a lot of figuring out you know you have to figure jazz out you, you really do for some families it's really char challenging to you know i guess cope with the idea of your child being an artist but your parents were musicians and everything oh my dad was so great my dad was always like so supportive and just loving always a hundred percent for whatever i wanted to do my, yeah right there you know just yeah, he was the greatest. Did he give you any lessons on piano? Or no, he didn't. Or? He didn't know how to play piano. I, I taught myself how to play piano from watching um, musicians, and I learn a voicing, and then I go home and learn it in all twelve keys. And I literally taught. I've never had uh, any piano lessons, although I, you know, uh, bounced a few uh, voicings off, uh, you know, um, a few pianists. But you know, throughout my uh, career I've had like several solo piano gigs in the last decade is subbing for Mike Wofford at his steady gig mm -hmm. up at um, it, it's a background uh, you know it's not like a burning trio gig or anything uh -huh. I would never proclaim to play in the realm of what he you know um, can do but but I know how to do that kind of gig let's put it that way because I've had a lot of so solo gigs uh, periodically throughout my life so I've always used piano as like a solo instrument or backing students or writing and composing you know mm. but it's a great tool and you know i think every horn player should really learn how to play a little piano i think it's really important you know to really see those voicings and really it helps you to figure it out i realized early on i was going to have to learn piano you know to play standards i was like no i got to see that i i don't understand what you know um what this chord is 
I don't really understand this. You know, mm. stuff like that. You, you have to see it. You, I mean, you really do. You, you, gotta, you just gotta look at it. You gotta look at those altered dominants and just kind of go, okay, you know. And if you want to do that stuff on your horn. Those kitchen sink chords, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's also, uh, you know, Charles explained it to me in an interesting way. From mm -hmm. horn, for horn players, we think more horizontal. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. harmony players think more vertically. That's that's true, you know, and and, and then there's also like, uh, how do you want a voice? Do you want cluster? You know, do, do you want like cl cluster voicings, or or do you want a uh, real open? You know, do you want like so? Yeah. You, and you can apply that stuff on your horn the way you solo too. Like, do you want to do big open chord, uh, open voicings, or do you want cluster sounds? You know. You know, I see on your website and articles and everything and I see this mm. phrase all the time from mm. Bach to bebop um, what does that mean to you <laughs> um, you know all that really means is that um, I can play classical and I can play jazz you know um, and I've always loved both types of music a lot um, always consider myself more of a jazz player but I feel like the flute um, is really a classical instrument when you get right down to it. Uh, you know, Hubert Laws graduated from Juilliard. You know, he studied with Julius Baker, who was the principal flutist in the New York Phil for 40 years. He, you know, and it really, and it shows, you know, if you if you want the flute, I always wanted the flute to sound good. You know, I'm all about sound, pitch, you know, control, dynamics, if possible, you know. And, it, you know, if you're not playing a little bit of classical on the flute, it, it really shows. I mean, it really, I can just hear instantly what somebody is up to when I go to hear and play. I, I just, also inspiration from composers. I mean, how do you do it on your own? You, you know, you can't. I just feel like um, people who don't uh, want to play classical, it's just very limiting you limiting your your scope i i did i wasn't like super serious about um uh you know performing until i was in my 40s um and then i i i thought it's time to really tackle the flute and piano repertoire my husband herman challenged me um early on in our relationship to learn the copeland duo for flute and piano i'm like are you out of your mind i'm like that is way too hard i'm into jazz I, i'm not good no no that is just not going to happen. He's like, I, th I really think you can do it. And I'm like, oh, crazy. You know, I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my brain around that level, that depth of it. But then the more I was around Herman and him introducing me to a lot more repertoire and music and composers, I started thinking, well, you know, I mean, I do know, uh, you know, Bach and, and, Mozart and some 20th century repertoire, but just not the flute and piano repertoire. I'd been avoiding it, avoiding it, because I thought, didn't think I could do it. Um, I'm a perfectionist, it's one of my issues. I'm a recovering perfectionist now. But I did get really serious about diving into the 20th century repertoire. I met a pianist, fantastic pianist, made a record back in 2013 of all 20th century flute and piano repertoire. Was doing six recitals a year for eight years with this pianist. So I got real serious about it. And then she's, uh, you know, about five years older than me. She wanted to retire, uh, and it was a lot of work. We were getting together every single week at her house in Poway. That's how committed I got. Driving up there every week, rehearsing, new material, this, that, perfecting, blah, blah, blah. I'm really glad I made the record, because now I have a, you know, uh, yeah. What can a jazz artist learn from studying so much classical music? Well, first of all, it, it, it improves your craft, you know. Um, it gives you more facility of what you want to be able to do. It, it opens up your mind to uh, the way other composers think and um, gives you more ideas. Um, the 20th century repertoire is just 
it's incredible. I mean, the way some of these composers, like uh, my husband turned me on to one of the pieces on the record. I'll, I'll give you one of the records. Um, Sofia Gubaitalina, who was known as the female Shostakovich, studied with him and mentored with him. Um, and uh, I mean, it's just like, you hear a piece like that, and you're just like, God, how can I bring that some of that into my jazz, you know? That's what excites me, is how can I keep getting better and, um, you know, so that it's more multi-layered instead of just, uh, I never wanted to be a one-trick pony, like a lot are. Um, and I always just want to keep improving, uh, challenging myself, you know. For me, it was a big challenge to take on the repertoire. Um, uh, you know, look, uh, I just want to be able to keep playing as I get older. And um, I just find that I really have to stay on playing a little bit of classical. Um, if not every day, every week, something has to be done or else I can feel it, I can hear it, I can tell. And it's like, like Bach will give you endurance. So uh, like Sundays are kind of like my Bach day. Um, and I'll just get out all my Bach books, the sonatas, I have um, arrangements for flute of all the cello and violin uh, suites and um, uh, just a, uh, even some of the piano preludes have been uh, transcribed. So I have like several books. Or, and like I say, including the sonatas, um, and it's just like a day of Bach, and then it's like, okay, it's coming back, and the next day it's like, bam, you know. So Bach is great um, for a lot of things, uh, not just endurance, but harmonically, and evens out your eighth note playing in jazz, you know, because a lot of Bach is even 16th notes or even eighth notes, and that's really important, I think. And, and I think if you added rhythm to Bach, um, you know, it sounds just like a jazz, a jazz solo or something, you know, although a jazz solo would have more uh, rhythmical and probably some more triplet ideas, but Bach has plenty of that too. I just think they go hand in hand. So I made a thing out of it where I would open up with Diane Snodgrass, the, the pianist, and then the second half I would do a jazz set. And that was a really cool experience for, and it opened up for a wider audience, you know? Because then we get the classical people, we get the jazz people, so now you have a bigger crowd. And it's great, it's a real challenge to step out on the stage and play um, some of the classical repertoire. It's really hard. What commonalities do you think exist between jazz and classical, studying specifically with flute or piano? Well, a lot of the classical guys were improvising. Bach, it was all Im improvised. Um, you know, um, you know, loads of stories about a lot of the classical, uh, Chopin, the, the list. These are great improvisers. So um, I think improvisation is the link, you know, really between both. It's just that these guys had their stuff written out. They bothered to write it out. How do you create your own style and how do you get... I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I, um, use your imagination, you know, and uh, try to be uh, as honest as you can um, about what you're doing and not try to copy, although you can certainly emulate and, and let other people float through you like I've certainly thought about Eric Dolphy when I'm playing, no doubt, Hubert Laws. Absolutely, you know, uh, many jazz players, uh, you know, um, uh, I was just, I've been studying Nat Adderley uh, just recently, a solo of his on a blues, it's just astonishing stuff, you know, um, great to let other people come through your consciousness, but uh, I think you just have to trust in what you're doing and, and try to be honest about it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain the imagery concept? Oh yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I uh, I started studying with um, a pianist from Toronto. Uh, he was a professor of music there, um, and he would come to Los Angeles every year. And uh, I was introduced uh, to him through this incredible pianist, blind pianist that I worked with for most of my career, Dave Mackay. Um, and he used to study with Phil, and, and Phil worked with all instruments. And so um, I started studying with Phil Cohen, and he 
taught me more about the flute than any flute teacher I'd ever studied with. And in fact, my hero in New York, Judith, she also studied with Phil Cohen, along with this, uh, her husband, who at the time was this uh, really famous uh, French horn player. He used to study with them, and he worked with all instruments, but he gave me some tools um, that, uh, I say I had about probably 15 lessons with him. I used to go up every year when he would come and I'd have like a two, three hour lesson with him. And then I would take that back with me and really mold it to my instrument. Like, so now I've got all my own um, imagery ideas. So, um, I, I and I've kind of got them like in different categories. So. For example, like an, one imagery idea for, for the flute, like if you want to project, would be to like imagine that you're in a big concert hall, like the concert hall of your dreams. It can look any way you want. It can be as big as you want. And just send a sound out to the last row. And you'll instantly just get a bigger sound. So that's just a basic imagery idea. Um, another imagery idea would be um, so I like to have, and especially when I was playing a lot of classical, I was really having to figure out wider palettes of dynamics and colors. So that's another thing that classical music will do for a flutist. It will increase your technique so much farther than just improvising all the time. You know, uh, so one of the ways that I have figured out is uh, through the use of colors. So white gives you a sound, green gives you a sound, red gives you a sound, different, different sound. If I want really quiet, pastels are really great. So powder blue, lavender, those will give you softer, right? You know, it's really incredible stuff. Uh, also, um, uh, or you could see some, something soft, like um, a flower, like the petal of a leaf of a rose is really soft, it's velvet. So you can go in that direction. Butterflies, like if, you know, the, the flute has the potential of being really ethereal and the flute really needs to sound magical. It, it's the nature of that instrument. I don't know if that would really work on saxophone, you know, but on the flute, it, these ideas really are amazing. Um, is that a concept of visualizing as you're playing? Yep. Or, or just, just imagining a, it. Or is it a frame of mind? I mean, no, I, it's just imagining it, seeing it, seeing it in your mind. Um, uh, water is a really big one with the flute. To get uh, a type of airstream that the flute really loves, which is hot air or wet air, warmer air. Kind of, uh, so I'll be thinking water a lot. Tons of it. There's there's so much of this. I can't I can't even tell you. Is that is that from Phil Cohen? That's a direct kind of. Yeah, philosophy? I I started what my very first lesson. I thought he was nuts until I got back home and I started working with this stuff and that, then I started getting blown away. And then I started like I say molding it into working using it with my students and how can I really personalize some of these techniques? You know, hmm. there's a great piece of music by Catherine Hoover. Uh, called Cocapelli, and uh, it's a really great piece, and um, all about the navy. So when I was doing my recitals, oftentimes I would open up the sh open up a concert with sol uh, this solo flute piece, and give a whole like set it up like in the Grand Canyon, sun setting, Native Americans, the fire, you know, doing their dance and everything. I would set this picture, and then I would play the Cocapelli. It was really it was really great. I think. All of this stuff is great because what it does is it, it like gets you out of yourself in order to get back into yourself. If you can free yourself from uh, all the BS that all of us musicians go through, like I'm not good enough, I'm not sounding good today, blah blah blah, this and that, uh, you know, it's tough, right? Yeah. Or the other way, like a lot of musicians have the other problem where you know, the ego is uh, all the bravado and all that stuff where underneath are really just insecure. You know, you see a lot of that kind of stuff. It's hard to find a balance, but uh, for me, just trying to get into like uh, a picture of what I'm gonna do, so I'll try to see. Um, it helps me to get more into the music. Less thought, get out of my head, because that's always there too. You know, you get in your head and then you're done.
You step on stage, you get in your head, you're in trouble. So Dave Mackay was the pian was your piano teacher for a long time. Oh no, he was he was a musician that I worked with. Okay. Um, yeah, he um, uh, took me under his wing and uh, uh, brought me up to L.A. to do my first album uh, six months after we met with the great Andy Simpkins. I don't know if you guys know who that is. Mm -hmm. He was awesome. a, a member of the Three Sounds, and he mm -hmm. also was with Sarah Vaughan for thirty mm -hmm. years. Um, one of the greatest bass players on the planet. Uh, Dave just passed away uh, last year for, at, when he was 88. Um, yeah, I know, it's really tough. It's really tough. But, so how was that as a young, you know, as a young musician getting... Oh my God, well, I mean, meeting Dave, you know, completely changed my life. Um, how frequently do you go see Judith? Well, I try to go every year, but um, you know, once every other is probably a little bit more realistic. For a minute there, I was going every year. It just kind of depends on what's going on on here, you know. And when I hear Lori Bell say that there's a flutist, a classical guru flutist, I'm immediately intimidated. What, what does that mean to you, like a guru? Well, she's just so incredible. Um, I found out about Judith because I used to work with her husband, who was um, a really fantastic French hornist, who was part of the Lincoln Center Chamber Ensemble, who was a great classical player, but every year he was coming out and playing jazz with Dave and I, and just coming out and hanging out in California, playing jazz. He was a great improviser as well. Um, and you know, I worked with Bobby for uh, many years, um, Bobby Roach, for many years and then never really knew. I would always hear about his flutist wife, but never really like knew like what was up with that. And then one time he came and he laid a cassette on me. He goes, oh, here, here's Judith. Here's, here's a copy of one of her recitals. So now I'm leaving where he was staying. I'm in my car. I got the cassette in the car and I'm like, and now I'm like not driving anywhere. I'm not driving anywhere. And I'm just like jaw drop, you know. And now I go, I have to go back into the house and I'm like, why didn't you tell me? I'm like, are you, and I was, I was, I really could barely talk. Could barely speak. What was it about her playing that really? Oh, she's just incredible. She, she studied with Moise, um, um, ugh. Uh, utter, total virtuoso, uh, her sound uh, is the fattest uh, lower octave in the business, um, exquisite phrasing, incredible control, um, I mean I could go on and on and on about her, her playing, uh, just ugh. really, she's really in my top five favorite classical players um, of all time. And there's a lot of really great classical players. Um, I'm really picky though. After her, it's like really picky, really picky. And you know, she never really made a solo album. She's recorded for Columbia. She she did a few side projects, but she never. And I kept bu I bugged her for about ten years straight. When are you going to make a record? And she's just so busy in New York. This that so busy. Never had. To, and it's just like wow, you know. 
you have 10 album releases uh, as a lead, at least as far as the website's <laughs> updated, and then about 17 as, as a sideman. Um, yeah. That's a lot of recordings, man. It is? It's, uh, really? Most recently mm -hmm. was in 2016 with Brooklyn Dreaming, um, yeah. mm -hmm. and then Blues, just Blues in yeah. 2017. Yeah. Was and there a more recent? Yeah, actually, uh, we have a posthumous release uh, from 2004. Uh, with the Interplay Trio, with Dave McKay and mm -hmm. Ron Satterfield and myself. So that um, is a kind of a brand new album that, when I was cleaning out my studio, I found the recording. So um, this was from 2004, uh, and it was right before um, Resonance Records started their label. George Clayton brought me up to do this gig at the Vic, it was, which was a great venue in Los Angeles, and um, it was in Santa Monica. And uh, he recorded the, he recorded that that night, and then he just laid the discs on me, and I just put them in my, I never even listened to it, because I was working so much back then that I was just like, oh, thanks, bam, you know, what's next? You know, um, where are we playing tonight? You know, I never even, but you know, when I was cleaning out my studio, and of course, Dave, you know, I knew wasn't doing well. Um, and actually, Dave and I had to stop. Dave had started getting dementia really about 10 years ago. Uh, so he wasn't remembering any of the interplay arrangements anymore, which was really sad. Although we were still doing a few gigs with Dave here and there, but it just wasn't like what it was, you know. Um, anyway, uh, so when I came across that, I was like, ooh. Look at that. And I clearly remembered the night and everything. And I was like, so I put it in my car and I'm driving back and I was just like, oh my God, Dave sounds incredible. Oh my God, I've got to make a record out of this. I mean, I just so, Ron and I decided to just kind of, we, we really just did it homemade for now. Yeah, you know, we just kind of made a homemade label out of a great photo of us. And we just kind of, just to get it, you know, eventually I'm probably going to have it pressed and do the whole, I don't know, na nowadays nobody presses anymore anyway, do do they? I mean, I don't know. I could do MP3s with it and that would be fine, you know. Um, I think I play a lot better now, but, you know, that was back in 2004, so I'm always like super critical of, you know, the way I sound, but but Dave just sounds so amazing, and the tr and the group is on fire. You know, this was like we were peeking out, and you know, uh, 1999 I think was our first Interplay record, something like that, and then 2003, and then George Clayman just happened to record us. Um, you know, but Dave and I, I I was able to do two albums with Dave before Ron even came into the picture. You know. Um, and uh, yeah, so we had a trio with Ron called Interplay, yeah, drumless, because uh, Ron does a lot of uh, jazz bass, and he's really amazing. Uh, he really is. In the state of like plastic pandemonium, where you like, where you know, like, you like being busy and you like to keep working. Well, I had to make a living for one. Well, true, yeah. I mean, that's how I made <laughs> make a living, you know. Uh, yeah, I've had to wear a lot of hats, you know, uh, teaching, you know, solo piano gigs, uh, classical jazz, you know, whatever, you know, um, bring it on. I mean, you know, so yeah, I mean, who's not going to take the work? I mean, yeah. when did you start teaching? Uh, oh, gosh, um, <laughs> almost right away, almost right away. Uh, I had a fair amount of students. Um, when I was in my 20s. But then when I got really busy performing, that slacked off. It was always like, kind of like that. Like, oh, I'm teaching a lot now. And like, oh, now I'm, you know, going to going to Asia. Or, so I'm not gonna teach for a minute. Uh, you know, so it was always like that. I always had a few floating around, you know. Um, now I've had regulars for a while. Um, uh, so yeah, I started teaching pretty early on. What's something that you've learned from teaching? Uh, how to be a better player. Hmm. And how to really help people. How to find uh, what people's needs are. Everyone is so individual. Um, yeah, I mean, and how to stay on my game and, you know, really be able to do that, like, 
how can I help this person, you know? What, what do they really need from me, you know? It's not, maybe it's not about imagery. Some people can't relate to that. You know, maybe it's all about the technical ex aspect of it. That's fine, I can go there. Uh, or maybe they can relate to it and that'll help them 10 times faster if they want to do that and have an experience, you know? So it's just about, I don't know, uh, yeah, how to be really a better player. It, it makes you better, I think, teaching. What is a personal obstacle that you overcame to be where you are and be the musician that you are? Mm -hmm. To put you on the track that you, that, that you wanted to be on, like, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, um, I am a recovering perfectionist. So I would have to say perfectionism has always been, uh, well, it's a strength and a weakness, you know? A lot of, uh, some of my friends say, well, but that's why you're so good at what you do. And I'm always like, yeah, but it's never good enough. Never happy. Somebody come up and compliment me on a gig. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't sound good. I used to do that a lot when I was younger. People, oh, sounds so great. Oh, no, 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 I didn't like it. Could never, like, yeah, oh, yeah. I was like that for years. Now I'm lightening up. I'm learning how to... Life as a musician during COVID. Um, what changed for you in March of 2020? I just started shedding more and composing. I started composing for a new album. Um, even wrote a couple short classical pieces for solo flute that I have up on my YouTube channel. Yeah, that was a first. Never composed anything classical for the flute, so I did that. Started composing some other stuff that I'm penciling now because we're on charted. And, there's a few mistakes here and there, and I'll, I'll make some changes. Um, so that's what I got busy doing. And just started practicing a lot, you know. Um, started going back and looking at some of the repertoire that I had recorded and see where am I at now with it, because I hadn't been really playing that for a couple years. And, you know, I was getting a little concerned about trying to keep up that level. I just, I, I actually had a brand new album come out in 2020, January with Ron and Tommy. We have a little group called Trio de Janeiro mm -hmm. and we put out a James Taylor reimagined mm -hmm. CD with all of Ron's really cool arrangements. Um, it's a really cool album. So we, you know, basically did two gigs and we had to cancel the tour. And we just said, I just sort of went, well, I mean, you just have to, what are you gonna do? You just got to ex accept, I mean, what's happening. Um, I, I just, you know, I, um, I like to stay home and practice. So I, I like shedding. I, I like being home and working on stuff. I thought it was kind of an interesting opportunity to spend more time alone and just working on different uh, things with jazz and piano. You know, I wound up getting a nice new little piano and yeah. I'm just glad a few more calls are starting to come in right now. Uh, I have a few things to look forward to coming up, which is great. Um, staying, I really try to stay in gratitude. That helps me to get through a lot, staying in gratitude. Even if I'm not gigging, I just try to stay in gratitude for the fact that I have really had a nice career. Uh, wasn't extraordinary, but it was really great. Um, you know, I really can't complain, you know. Um, yeah, it would have been nice to have taken it to the next level, but you can't do that living here. You really got to be in New York. You really do. Uh, or at least L.A., you know. <laughs> Why do you call your flute the evil princess? Oh, because she's a total prima donna. And she's evil. Why is she evil? Because... She's, you know, nothing's easy about it. Is it your flute or is it just like flute in general? Flute, just the flute. Like when I open up the case, you know, and I look at it, it's like I can almost hear, hear it saying, oh, so you think you're gonna play me today? It's evil, you know what I mean? Right, and then you get it in your hands and like some days it's great and other days it's like, oh. Right, really, okay. No, she really makes you work. I mean, it's a, it's a really difficult instrument to play well. But you know what? She can also be glorious. So if, if, if you treat it right, if you, you know, 
do the technique if you give her what she likes then she'll give you the whirl right but if you're just a little off just a little bit it'll you can still play you know look you hear flute players all the time and you can still play the flute anybody can blow into a flute and play a flute right you know but it's getting it to sound magical that's the challenge getting it to sound like something in nature like the butterflies and the waterfalls and the hummingbirds and you know all the ethereal stuff that the flute is great at if you can do all that then you're having a great day